Welcome everyone. In this episode, we are discussing pain, physical activity, and activities of daily living. And we have a real expert for the topic. Our guest is working as an IT coordinator in Jena University Hospital in Germany. He holds a PhD in engineering and specializes in artificial intelligence, computer architecture, data mining, anesthetics, and surgery. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Dr. Marcus Coleman. Welcome, Marcus. It's an honor to have you in the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me, Oli. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, great to great to have you. And you have a little bit different kind of background than many of our other guests. So could you start a little bit sharing your journey into the field of research? What initially sparked your interest in studying pain and its its effects on on patients? Yeah, it's totally true. I'm not a I'm not from the medical field originally. I started as a computer scientist, as you said, and I, I was interested in, in the early days of artificial intelligence. So I was studying ant algorithms on dedicated hardware with highly multi-parallel sensors and stuff like that. So totally different. And after my PhD, I yeah just applied for some open jobs. And then the first one that got me was in the hospital and they called me and initially they I wanted to take some time to think about where I'm going, but they said, yes, and we want to have you right now. And so I said, okay. Uh, And I thought I will have a look later, what other opportunities come up in my life. But yeah, then I was in the hospital and there was some kind of glue where I just got stuck there because the topic was really interesting. It was new to me, it was pain. And pain is interesting because it is, there is no gold standard for measuring it. Yeah. And a lot of things you can in data science measure binary or maybe with a interval scaled level so you know if someone died or not and then you can make analysis but in pain it's not that easy how do you measure it the only solution we have right now is asking patients about it and then you need a lot of patients to get yeah, some sense of reliability towards the whole population and this let's say, uh, uncertainty about the truth, I think is really interesting. And uh, so, yeah, I got stuck. And now, 15 years later, I'm still here. And I have I hope I have uh, made some medical experiences too in the meantime, I guess so. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. I had a astrophysicist who was doing sleep research. And she was actually developing kind of new ways of analyzing or understanding it and it, it was very interesting so i think it's very interesting when when kind of backgrounds and fields overlap because you see see things differently and and me and many of the probably in the audience come from the sports background and we probably have a kind of different take on the pain or perspective as usually it's we are training and we we get pain after training, especially strength training, and then there's probably injuries which are sport or physical activity related, but usually not. Maybe we don't think it as much as a surgery and the recovery from surgery. So it's interesting also to kind of see the the pain from the different different fields. And and you you said that it's mainly about pain in the hospital. Could you clarify a little bit, like what are the main areas of research that you are you are currently working on? Yeah, that's exactly true. So sports pain is probably totally different right here. We are talking mainly today about uh, post-surgical pain. This means if a patient comes to the hospital, has a surgery, for example, back surgery, knee surgery, whatever, they have pain due to their surgery because there is an incision, there is a cut, and this leads to pain. And obviously, this pain is unwanted because it can impede the recovery process. It holds patients in the bed, maybe, so they should stand up and get moving, but sometimes they don't because they have a lot of pain. And obviously, it's a burden, so there's a lot of research on how to reduce this burden of pain. Mm. There's also chronic pain. I guess we're talking about that too today. This is pain that is either a chronification of, for example, post-surgical pain. So you get an incision and then it stays. Or it could also be uh, due to an injury in sports or just 
it just sometimes develops, for example, back pain. I mean, that's a, a really a population issue. Yeah? Uh, a lot of people have that and they have lower back pain all the time. And then sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse. And you can do a lot of research on that too. But it's, as you said, uh, different from sport pain, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, if we go to your specific studies that you have, you have done, there is the study of physical activity and post-surgical pain. Could you tell more about this study? What were the ob- objectives and what, what did you discover? I start with the with the main project. It was a European fund project, so the European Commission they distribute some money to uh, research projects. A lot of people might have heard that, and we also got a grant. It's it was a re- very large grant, several millions of euros. And the goal of this whole uh, effort was to harmonize pain questioning. As I said before, there is no gold standard how to measure it, and there are lots of instruments that you can use on the patients to measure their pain. Yeah, this. In principle, means different questionnaires with different questions. And obviously, it would be very nice to make research results comparable if all would ask the same questions, but they don't. And the main goal of this whole project was to harmonize these questionnaires so that everyone in the world in the ideal case would use the same questionnaires and every research on pain would be done with the same instruments. I'm not sure we will reach that goal. Actually, I don't think so. But if we harmonize it a bit, it It is already very good. And what we did for that is we included patients from four types of surgery, um, breast surgery, endometriosis-related surgery, um, stenotomy, and total knee arthroplasty. And um, we followed them, them up after their surgery. So they received for several points in time questionnaires uh, where we asked them, how large is your pain? Um, how do you feel moving? What side effects do you have? And so on. And of course, we also uh, collected uh, baseline data, so demographics, how old uh, they are, their gender, and so on, and also their clinical processes, which pain medications did they get. And uh, this was one part of the project, and then we tried to analyze these data. And as a sub-project, we also gave some of these patients activity trackers. They wore them on their arm, and we wanted to know, that was the main question, what is the relation between post-surgical pains in the first week after surgery and activity. So how much do they do they move? Do they get out of bed? Are they active as before surgery or not? And actually, there's not a lot of data on this topic out there. There's maybe one or two publications that have done something similar, but not a lot is known about that. There is more literature on chronic pain and chronic activity, but in this short-term phase after surgery, there's not a lot of data. And so we gave these activity trackers to the patients. They wore them for one week and then sent them back to the hospital. And then we read out the data and made a comparison between activity and pain. And for the results, the first thing we found is not very surprising is that activity levels improved after surgery on average, not for every patient, but on average, patients get back to normal activity levels, not in the first seven days, but the slope is definitely moving upwards and they're getting near to what normal people would do. Mm. Thought that pain would hamper their movement. So patients with higher pain would have less activity. I mean, that's something you see in chronic pain patients and probably also in sports medicine. Uh, Pain could be a burden and lead to less movement, but actually in our cases, in our patients, we did not find them. That was really surprising to us. But there was no strong correlation between pain and activity in the first week after surgery. And this is actually, yeah, we don't know why that is. Yeah, We concluded that pain and activity are two different entities of recovery. So in the hospital, uh, doctors, they want patients to move relatively early. We know that. Um, if they don't move, if they don't are not active, they will have complications later. And mm-hmm. because of that, they are forced or let's say pushed to move very early. There are enhanced recovery after surgery programs and so on to reduce the time that patients stay in bed. And we would have thought that, yeah, this would, we would also see this in our data, but for pain, there is no correlation. So these are two entities, pain and activity, and they 
don't seem to interfere. And our conclusion, our big conclusion in the end was that the doctors in the hospitals should look at both measures. They should look at activity and pain as measures of recovery. So looking only at one of those and using it as a replacement for the other does not work. It's, it's not working. They have to look at both and they have to be uh, aware that patients have to re reduce, have, sorry, have to have reduced pain but they should also be very active. And those two don't belong together that much. Mm. Yeah, actually, when you when you said about the study design, I in my mind, I thought that probably there's not a strong correlation as, as you would think. I just had a, someone uh, I knew being a surgery and I was, I was looking closely the recovery process. And I, I think it's also, especially after surgery, the pain, it's it probably causes a little bit fear or anxiety. And we know that pain is also psychological in a way that what is your attitude towards the pain? Do you think it's it's kind of that if you have pain and you move that you will you will destroy something, you will break something. But if you if you can if you know that moving is good, you can probably move despite the pain. And I think it probably links to kind of the personality of the person, how the doctors are encouraging that you should move even with the pain. Did you look anything, did you have any questionnaires about the attitude of the pain or, or do, you, do you think these kind of things link to the topic? You seem to be a, a pain expert, I have to say, Oli, because <laughs> that is really actually where the pain research in general is going right now. 10 years ago, when I started, people were mainly looking at maximal pain levels. So patients were asked, how much is your pain? And then on a 0 to 10 or 0 to uh, 100 scale, they said, I have pain of strength 9. Yeah, whatever. And then everything was uh, compared to, to that. And But now we have a, a strong movement to in, interpreting pain more multidimensional. And this, what you said is completely true. We know that anxiety self-efficacy, psychosocial behaviors are very important for the development of chronic pain and also for how patients cope with acute pain. And this multidimensionality is something that is on one hand somehow obvious. Yeah, It's, it's not just a, a bodily response to a, a trauma, for example, but it's, it's more. And we also know that if you're in lower social classes, you might be more prone to have higher pain scores and so on. So it's really a, a more complex issue. And actually, we would need to do this study again and ask more of these questions. We did ask about self-efficacy and about anxiety because we already know that because it's been developing in the research field like that. And we tried to include this into the analysis, but it did not change too much. So it is also possible that pain is just a representation of anxiety in the patient uh, is simply said, and it's not that easy, but maybe they are just different expressions of the same underlying process. And uh, mm -hmm. that's why maybe we didn't find anything serious about that. But I wanted to add, we also looked at other outcomes. We did not just look at pain. We also looked, for example, if patients wished for more pain treatment. We know that this is a very important measure. If patients feel well in the hospital, if they feel well treated and have uh, contacts to the personnel of the hospital, they are much more satisfied and they also have reduced levels. This is also part of anxiety. Yeah? If you if you are fearing something and nobody's there to talk about it and help you, uh, then your fear is growing. Yeah, But if someone's there, you can talk about it, some, uh, a professional, that obviously helps. So we also know that, that, but even for those outcomes, we did not find a correlation to activity. So mm. it really is a different entity. That's uh, the, the main result we found. And I, I think that's quite interesting. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is, is interesting. And you said that I, I would be expert on pain. That's, that's definitely not true. Maybe it's like <laughs> being over 40 and training every day. So you, <laughs> you, 